means, motive, opportunity. How an overlooked verse in the Gospel of John sheds light on the crime of the millennia. The latest news, history, and analysis from the perspective of the first Christians. Tune into the FBN Worldwide 24 7 radio stream. We recently did an audiobook promotion, and as part of the giveaway, we asked viewers to send in their best questions. And one of the first questions was from Greta in Missouri, and she asked if we had any views on the long-running debate among biblical scholars about the census described in the Gospel of Luke. Now, apparently, it's a big controversy with one side saying there was never a census, and that proves that Jesus was born in Nazareth, not Bethlehem. And the other side claiming that there really was a census, and Mary and Joseph were sent to Bethlehem. Now, I was going to write back and tell her to stop trolling me with low-effort questions because anyone who actually reads the very first Bible will tell you that the very first sentence in the Gospel of the Lord tells us that Jesus descended from heaven into Capernaum in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. In other words, Jesus arrived on earth the same way that he left it after his crucifixion, ascending and descending from heaven. Very simple. So the pre-Nicene Christians weren't familiar with these later stories of birth in a Bethlehem horse stall as told by the anonymous authors of Matthew and Luke, which were written much later. In fact, the Apostle Paul never heard of it either. He describes Jesus as taking on a human form, just as described in that first sentence in the Gospel of the Lord. There's nothing about a Joseph and Mary and horse stalls in Bethlehem. Trust me, I checked. Now, Paul put his own name to what he wrote, but the authors of the other four Gospels and Acts did not do that. They wanted to remain anonymous for some reason. So, as a pre-Nicene Christian, I simply don't have a dog in that fight, in, in that debate. So, as, as far as we're concerned, both sides are wrong. Where, when, and what was required of the census is irrelevant because the underlying premise of the story is false. So let's get back to our fake debate of the census in Nazareth and Bethlehem. Now, why is there an argument to even begin with? And for that answer, we need to go way, way back. We need to go back to the fights between the first Christians and the Ebionites. We need to go back to the battle between the apostles and the Judaizers at the Council of Jerusalem in 48 AD. In fact, we need to go all the way back to the first fight between Jews and Jesus. Literally the same fight that continues to this day. Now, simply put, what we're talking about is a crime. Really, the greatest crime ever committed. You've heard the term stolen valor. Well, this crime is called stolen divinity, a religion hijacked. Now, before I get into this, it's important that you have a copy of the pre-Nicene Bible with its original ten epistles to follow along with. The edited and extra epistles you find in the modern Bible won't do you any good for this episode. Now, after Jesus descended into Capernaum, literally Satan's backyard, he chose the most evil area on the planet for a reason. It was no accident. He wasn't there to negotiate with them or waste his time. He told them that they were the children of Satan, that they didn't know God and God didn't know them. They were rejected by Jesus, and they killed him for it. You see, being told that you're a hypocrite that worships Satan has a tendency to rub some people the wrong way, I guess. So with that as a backdrop for our story, let's talk about means, motive, and opportunity. Now, some of these people couldn't let go of the idea that even in death, Jesus could be useful to them. They couldn't erase his memory and teachings, and it was too late to stop the Apostle Paul, who had already gone out and preached the gospel of the Lord and established Christian churches across the known world. That cat was out of the bag, and it wasn't coming back. But let's stop the film right there. Let's pause it. This is a really good time to just debunk Matthew and Luke's bedtime story about the horse stalls of Bethlehem. These two Gospels represent the Messianic cult which existed among some of the apostles. These were Jews who 2,000 years ago were determined to make the square peg of Judaism fit into the round hole of Christianity. 
Now, today you might know them as Jews for Jesus or watch them on TV shows working the stage as evangelical preachers. But back then they were called Ebionites and they had a great deal of influence on Peter and James. We're going to get more into that a little bit later. But for now, it's enough to know that Peter and James were tasked with converting Jews to the views of the Messianic cult. Now, we can all read that in Galatians and the big fight that they had at the Council of Jerusalem in 48 AD. There's no mystery about that. Paul was to convert the nations, in other words, you and me, and Peter and James were to convert the circumcised, i.e. the Jews. Now, this messianic cult was determined to make everyone believe that Jesus was from the direct line of David and Abraham and run that line right back to a God they say made them the chosen people. The son of a God they didn't even know with documented miracles and fame was going to be appropriated by Jews. In many ways, this was about ego. And it really shouldn't come as a surprise when you consider their well-documented history of self-worship, a trait that's on full display even today. That's right, they claim. We knew all about this Jesus guy, knew it all along. In fact, we wrote about him in our Torah. It's all in the prophecies in our scrolls. Now, keep in mind, these are the same people that Jesus rejected, the same people that murdered Jesus. But now they're saying, yeah, we knew all about him. He comes from our God. Yeah, we killed him, but he's from our lineage. You see, heads we win, tails you lose. But like with most crimes, there was a little detail, a little problem that wasn't fully thought out about. And this tiny problem they had was selling and schlepping this story. Because back then, in the years right after the resurrection of Jesus, nobody would buy that fairy tale. And do you know why we know they had a problem with the Son of David marketing effort? Not only because it wasn't true, but because we know everybody knew it wasn't true. You see, for all the clever editing and omissions that were done to weave together this magical, non-existent Jewish backstory for Jesus, they couldn't spot and fix everything. You see, in a story this big, there's no such thing as the perfect lie or the perfect crime. Four Gospels, edited epistles they took from Paul, and finally, the book of Acts as the giant glob of Bondo that was supposed to fix all the holes and smooth over any unsightly facts. But they missed something, or as Columbo would say, just one more thing. And that one more thing is John 7, 40 through 42. It's damning. And they're not my words. The right from the modern Bible itself, the motive in neon lights, the problem they had to fix at any cost. Let's read it together. Verse 40. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Verse 41. Others said, He is the Messiah. Still others asked, How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Verse 42. Does not scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? So, you see, every Jew on the planet knew Jesus wasn't born in Bethlehem. It's literally in the gospel. No more prophecy, no more Torah-linked fairy tales. Now, not to put too fine a point on it, but this is a huge problem if you're trying to schlep the Jesuses from the line of David carpet bags. And I have to tell you, if I was presented with this problem, I would say, you know what? We need to start a different cult because this one is DOA. It's just not happening. That verse alone destroys the underlying premise. So how do you fix something that's this unfixable? The solution that they came up with was jaw-dropping in its hubris and stunning, even for these people, in its audacity. And I want you to think about this carefully, how their solution is actually two miracles in one. It's like the enchilada of miracles. You can't make this up. They solved not only the Jesus not born in Bethlehem problem, they also fixed the Jesus descended into Capernaum problem in one fell swoop. 
I mean, it makes you wonder if the Warren Commission got their magic bullet theory from these guys. They said, yeah, well, what had happened was there was a snap emergency census and um, this Jewish guy, Joseph and Mary, who were part of David's lineage, lived in Nazareth, but um, had to go to Bethlehem for the census, see? And um, because she was like pregnant, Jesus was born there. Yeah. Yeah, that's the ticket. He was born in Bethlehem and that fulfills the prophecy and it's all part of the Old Testament and Torah. Yeah, that's the ticket. See, it all fits now. Now, forget about all that other stuff. This is the real story now. And by the way, this is exactly why detectives record their interview with you after a crime. So not only did they magically make him Jewish, they retroactively changed his birthplace to Bethlehem with a single card trick. Stolen divinity. Now, unfortunately for them, John never got the memo. He never got the new talking points about this. And somebody forgot to edit chapter 7, verse 42 out of his gospel. And as if it can't get worse, the comment about Bethlehem was made in the presence of Jesus with no retort or response or clarifying remark. And when they decided that this was the new story that they were going to go with, they doubled down hard. The Luke narrative even throws in some Persian kings with a side order of Zoroastrianism in there just for holistic flavoring. And Matthew reads like a guest list at a bar mitzvah. I mean, Matthew supersized the lineage angle. Go and read the first few pages. We'll wait a few hours until you get done. And do you know what the end result of this master class in creative writing was? Well, not a single Jew believed a word of it and converted. See, to Jews, the story is just as laughable now as it was 2,000 years ago. But don't take my word for it. Find a random Jew and ask him. In fact, it's one of the very few things I agree with them on. About anything. And when you get done, go look in Paul's original epistles. There's not a word about Bethlehem and horse stalls or even anyone named Mary and Joseph. Again, from Paul we learn that Jesus took on a human form, fitting perfectly with the first sentence of the Gospel of the Lord and his descent into Capernaum from heaven. Came to earth the same way he left it, ascending and descending from heaven. Pretty much what you would expect from God. At the end of the day, the square peg didn't fit 2,000 years ago and it doesn't fit now. Remember, Jesus transcended race all races. He didn't play favorites and choose one group over another. Romans chapter 2 verse 1 through 2 is crystal clear on this as we read, Thus we see that the judgment of God is on the basis of truth, for there is no favoritism with God. Unquote. So the Jews in their own minds might be the chosen people of some deity somewhere, real or imagined, but it's not our Christian God revealed to us only through Christ. These are the facts, and they are undisputed. Everything we need to know about God and what God wants us to know about Him is contained in the first Christian Bible of 144 AD. There's no need to mix oil and water and drag someone else's carnal religion into it and then spend a lifetime wondering why it doesn't make any sense. Maybe it's time to reconnect with the forefathers of your faith. Maybe shake off the chains of your theological Stockholm Syndrome. I don't think it's ever too late to do that. As pre-Nicene Christians, we can only look on in horror at the state of Christian churches around the world today. At some point, will people pause for a moment, look at the big picture and ask themselves, why am I internalizing the commands of my oppressor? Why am I so gullible? Remember, Christ compels us to seek and hold on to the truth, not to just accept our fate and drown in the spiritual dead sea of exegetical nonsense when rescue is right at hand. And by the way, I did send Greta her audiobook. Thanks for listening. This has been Darren Kalama for First News on FBN. Kill them all. Old and young, girls and women, and little children. Does that sound like something Jesus would ever say to you? The first Christians didn't think so either.
and that's why you won't find the Old Testament in the first Christian Bible of 144 AD. Reconnect with your pre-Nicene Christian roots and the Bible you were meant to have. Ten books and the Gospel of the Lord. Download your free ebook at theveryfirstbible.org.